I love um, your comment, Liz, about seeing more women and more girls out there bravely working in STEM, inventing things, um, boldly talking about what they've invented. And um, we have the opportunity today to spend a bit of time with one of those people. McKinley is going to come up and just share her story with you. Um, and I'm sure later on we want to hear your stories as well. McKinley's just a couple of years older than you. Um, and she is an inventor. And I'm going to leave it at that because she's going to come up here and tell her story. Um, so don't see this as a speech. Don't see this as a keynote presentation or a lecture. See this as you hanging out with a friend who's going to talk about what it means to be an inventor and create things and build things in science and technology. So McKinley, all yours. Thank you. Thank you guys and hopefully guys are having a good time already. Uh, as I said, my name's McKinley and I'm only a couple years older than you. So I'm only 20 years old. I'm just finishing up my second year of university. Uh, so the horrors of high school are still freshly implanted in my brain. So I just want to share with you my story and my journey, albeit a short one so far. But to do that, I have to start at the beginning. And for me to do that, I want to ask you a question. Raise your hands real quick if any of you own a pair of sunglasses. Okay, awesome. Pretty much everyone in the room. Uh, keep your hands up if you own two pairs of sunglasses. Three pairs of sunglasses. Four. Five. Okay, everyone's down at five. Well, when I was quite young, uh, I owned too many sunglasses to count. In fact, I had about 15 when I was about seven. And understandably, my mum kind of, at, there was a point where she said, look, we're not buying you any more sunglasses. This is getting a little bit ridiculous. And not understanding that money didn't, in fact, grow on trees yet, I was not too happy with this prospect. So kind of in a bit of spite, I said, fine. Well, if you're not going to buy me any, I'll make my own then. Mum's like, cool, OK, good for you, thinking nothing of it. And I came back with my first invention, a pair of very attractive sunglasses. This is me when I was seven years old. Um, never went into business, not quite sure why they wouldn't have sold. Maybe something about the fact that they were absolutely hideous. Um, I thought they were quite fashionable. But the thing that was special about this pair of sunglasses is that they were the last pair of sunglasses that I would ever need. You see, I decided that I wanted to wear sunglasses all the time, but understandably when it's either a super cloudy or rainy day and you're wearing sunglasses, it's probably a bit hard to see. So I made a pair of adjustable tint sunglasses. So this pair of sunglasses had two layers, uh, which were attached by magnets and they used polarizers, which you may have come across in science, but basically they're two sheets of kind of plasticky looking thing. And if you twist one against the other, it makes it darker or lighter. And that's what these sunglasses did. So, you know, if it was too glary outside, you could make it darker. Or if I really shouldn't have been wearing sunglasses, but because I wanted to be fashionable, I was going to anyway, I could make them a lot lighter. And that was my first ever invention. Uh, although I did start a little bit earlier, to be honest. This is a photo of me and my brother on the kitchen table doing your classic volcano uh, baking soda experiment. But since then, I've moved on to other inventions such as this, which is the scale mail armour for radiation therapy, uh, or the smart armour. If you want to, at the end, I've got it in my bag so I can, uh, I can show it to you. But this was working in radiation therapy for breast cancer patients. Women who undergo radiotherapy for breast cancer are estimated that one in 14 of them will develop a second cancer in their other breast later in their life because of the treatment that they got and the radiation that were exposed to. And I saw this statistic and thought this was incredibly unfair. You know, women who are already going through this horrific treatment, which can, you know, have things like skin burning and the risk of another cancer forming, they shouldn't have to worry about that when really they're just trying to, say, to stay alive. And so this was my solution to that problem. It's able to block up to 80% of the radiation which would have otherwise been delivered to that other breast and potentially be able to improve lives. And this is one of the many inventions I did. I did this one when I was in year 10. Um, and I've done other work in looking at solar power and how you can increase, increase the efficiency of solar panels, looking at how you can deliver water to developing communities where they don't even have a tap where they can get safe drinking water. Uh, and I've looked at many other things along the way, pretty much doing a science project and invention every single year since those sunglasses. 
Uh, obviously, I moved away from kind of self-indulgent, what's going to help me, uh, and looking at how I could use my passion and my natural curiosity to help the world around me. You know, I was that kid who was always asking the question, why? I'd pester my parents, you know, why is the sky blue? Why do bugs crawl? And why do they have exoskeletons? And all these really cool questions. And they encouraged me to go find the answers. They wouldn't just tell me the answers, but would encourage me to experiment, to try to find out for myself. And this natural curiosity is what drove me, but it's also what drives the heart of STEM. You know, a lot of people may see coding as a kind of robotic, just plugging in numbers, but you can do more with that. It's not necessarily the doing it, it's what you can do with it. An experiment, yes, you may have to sometimes follow a procedure or a method that's planned, but it's being able to develop that experiment and maybe do something a bit fun and exciting or inventing. Uh, you know, it may start from just an idea, but it's that curiosity that can really change it. It's diving into an issue that you're interested in further, whether this be from something in biology, whether this be climate change, whether this be something in medicine, health, space. It's taking something you're interested in and really going deep into it. And I think this is one of the things that's fantastic about people like you and me. You know, we're young, we haven't gone into the workforce yes, yet, which yes may mean that we don't necessarily have the skills needed to succeed in a job as such yet, but we still have that curiosity. We still have that yearning and wanting to learn, that wanting to find out more. And along with that natural curiosity, it means that we as young people have something that no one of any other age has and it comes naturally us, to us. We're able to think outside of the box, intuitively. You know, you hear kids or students ask really, really random questions, and I know there are viral videos all over Facebook and such of the teacher going, I got asked this today, what was that all about? Like, where did that come from? You can have a conversation with a kid and it go in a completely opposite direction very fast, and that's because we just think, you know, there's no box yet. We haven't quite gone through the full of our education, and this still comes naturally to us. And it's one of our biggest assets, you know, being young can sometimes be difficult because you may feel you're too young to make the change, or you may feel that I don't have enough skills to be able to start a business, I don't know how to do that. But the thing is, you can do that through other ways. You know, you may not be following the conventional method, but because you're able to think outside of the box, it means that you're probably able to think of things that no other person in the whole world has thought of. And I found this in my own experiments. So I'll go back to Smart Armor really quick. One of the things that I wanted to determine when I was making the shield is what was I going to make it out of? You know, that was one of the first questions. And I looked into it and did some research and found that metals were probably the best as far as radiation shielding goes. And I went, okay, cool. I'm going to test a bunch of different metals to start off with. So to start off with, I just tested three, which were lead, aluminium, and copper. And at the time, uh, which I, I didn't know yet, um, lead is globally promoted and kind of still is globally promoted as the best radiation shield. You know, you go to, I don't know if any of you have been to the dentist and had an x-ray. Sorry if you have, I have. But they place a lead apron over you uh, to protect you from the radiation that you would receive. And so this is kind of globally promoted, globally known fact, lead's the best, end of story, full stop. But I didn't know this yet. And so I did a fair test, was testing all three. And my results found that copper was actually 20% more effective at the skin surface. And so at the time I went to uh, a researcher and a mentor who I had been fortunate enough to kind of, well, not fortunate enough, I annoyed them into being my mentor. Um, I didn't really give them a choice. But um, I went to him and I said, here are my results, awesome, we're gonna use copper. And he said, that can't be right. No, something's gone wrong in the experiment. It's supposed to be lead, go back and redo it. And so I left that meeting a bit deflated, but thinking, okay, you know, how, wh where, where would it have gone wrong? I, analyzed the method of my experiment, it all looked okay, and I was like, okay, I'll just redo it. And so I redid it. And then I redid it again. And then I redid it again. I redid it five different times and came up with the same result every single time. And it ended up being that, in fact, the results were right. The science was right. In radiotherapy, um, copper was actually 20% more effective than lead at the skin surface. And that was one of the really exciting discoveries of the project. The invention was amazing, but kind of shattering this illusion in radiation therapy was something that just came from pure curiosity and the fact that I didn't have experience in that workplace already and I didn't know that lead was supposed to be the best. I could keep an open mind and think outside of the box past 
the previously conceived ideas of what would work to what I was thinking might be possible. And that's been a lot of my journey, to be honest, has been experimenting, playing around, following what I'm passionate about, being curious, and trying to break and shatter the perceptions that exist for people like you and me. Now, in 2018, about 2018, I was starting, uh, I was doing year 11 and 12. I was about, about to graduate. And, you know, I was doing all these science experiments. I've been to international competitions. I've met some really, really cool people along the way because of these science projects. People were starting to call me an inventor, a scientist, even though I was still in school. And that was really awesome. You know, it was kind of nerve wracking and daunting at the same, at the same time. But it was daunting because of something else. At the same time that people were calling me a scientist in the media or, you know, saying you're an inventor, I was actually failing three out of my six year 11, 12 subjects. So you guys want to take a wild guess at what they were? Anything, don't worry, you won't offend me. <laughs> yes. English? No, not English. Any other guesses? Science, Science. exactly. I was failing <laughs> physics, chemistry and maths. <laughs> my best subject, in fact, was English literature, uh, something which I still love to this day. So I was taking psychology, Spanish, physics, chemistry, maths, English, and I was failing the three that I was supposed to be good at. Uh, I ended up being able to kind of pull my marks around in the end and, and ended up doing and ended up passing, but it showed me something. It made me realise that, yeah, okay, maybe this I wasn't doing too well in the science subjects at school. Maybe I wasn't so good at taking a test and writing out a formula, but that didn't disqualify me from STEM. That didn't mean that I couldn't still be a scientist and follow what I'm interested in, you know. I was curious about science and if I was curious about something I wasn't going to stop until I found a solution and that's what being a scientist is you don't have to be good at science at school and that's what I'd say to you guys you know if if you're not that great at biology don't rule out becoming a biologist or something to do with that field if you're not good at English don't rule out wait what are people with an English major do um, <laughs> writer, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, a uh, writer, a teacher, don't rule out these things just because you might not be doing too well at them at school, you know. Keep an open mind, you're still very young and the world's open to possibilities, you know, we're going to be having about four careers, I think, is the uh, estimate at the moment, I think, I'm sure the number's increasing every day, but it's estimated that our generation's going to have four careers in their lifetime. Now, that's not four jobs, that's four careers, so that's going from completely different fields. That means you might be a scientist. You might also end up being a fashion designer. You might also be, end up being someone in marketing all in your lifetime. And that's really cool. Um, and I think it's really, really awesome that we have the ability to do that. So, you know, success doesn't always look the same for everyone. Success for me wasn't passing my exams. It wasn't getting that top ATAR. You know, yes, that's important for some people. And if that's your goal, go for it. But success for me was my science projects and using my passion in STEM and my natural curiosity to help other people. That's where I found my most fulfillment and that's where I still find my most fulfillment and that's why I keep doing what I do, what I do. One thing that separates our generation from others gone past is that we're growing up in an unprecedented era. Like we heard earlier, you know, the rate at which technology is expanding and, and advancing is astronomical. It's, it's ex exponential. It's amazing. And we're lucky that we have the ability to have access to these resources in this day and age where no one else has before. Uh, one of the things that they've suggested our kind of era is going to be called is the information age because of the access to information, because of the amount of information. And it's not just this access, though, that's going to help us to change the world. It's going to be our ability in using it. It's not going to be, you know, our access to social media and being able to, you know, make a post. It's going to be our ability to use it to create global change. It's not going to be access to information that, you know, it might be great to Google some, a result and an answer for one of your assignments. Trust me, I did it too. But it's not that access. It's going to be how we use that resource to fuel your natural curiosity and to fuel the research that people like you and I will be doing, not just in the future, but now. You know, I know... Earlier we were talking about what do you want to be when you grow up, but I want to challenge you and I say, what do you want to be now? You know, you don't have to wait until you grow up. You don't have to wait until 
you've gone to university, you don't have to wait until, you know, you're 40 years old. What do you want to be now? Thank you. Yay. Thanks so much, McKinley. I'm Emily. I'm from Microsoft Surface. Hi, ladies. How are we all? She's kind of a big deal. Like, I think McKinley played herself down a little bit here, but she has a TED Talk. The prize that McKinley won for her smart armour, she's the only Australian ever to have won that prize. And how many were you competing against? It uh, was... 1,800. And I think we're going to... Can we have a look at it? Yeah, can we so show I can... Smart armor? I'll grab it. It's just in my bag. And I think but yeah. something I want to um, encourage you all to think about is the reason that McKinley was exposed to this was because I think her dad is um, in radiology. So he's got a medical background. And so what we're trying to do with See It Be It is give you guys exposure to people that are outside of your world that you might not meet in your day-to-day -day life. If you work at Boost Juice or your parents are hairdressers or run a restaurant, you might not know the jobs that are available to you and the things that can spark interest and excitement to get you to do something like McKinley did. Oh, it's beautiful too. It I want it on a leather jacket. I've had a lot of people tell me I should go into instead go into jewellery making or like costume design for Game of Thrones sort of thing. Totally. Um, but yeah, it's something I can, I don't know if we're allowed to with COVID pass it around. I don't mind them. It has been sterilised before use because that's one of the requirements for medical. But yeah. yeah. All good. We'll pass it around. Awesome. And one of the things that I find really exciting about this is obviously McKinley needed to use her science background to figure out how to do all of this and do the research. But where did the idea come for the design? So the idea for this design, for this project, in fact, came from history class. I was sitting in class and we were studying uh, ancient armies at the time. And I was doing my science project uh, out of school at the time and thinking, OK, now I've got my material. What do I actually want it to look like? What's going to be able to you know, conform to the body? Um, you'll be, be able to see when you when you have it, it's quite pliable. You kind of grab it and it flops. Um, and I was just sitting in history class one day and we had this, which is scale mail, uh, which was a form of ancient army that Roman and Persian armies uh, used to use in particular. And it was kind of a spark moment that went, that could work. And so I just ran with it. Very cool. So it comes from, ideas come from anywhere. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask McKinley? Don't be shy. Yeah. No. Yes. <laughs> what's, what's your uni degree at the moment? So I'm in fact doing engineering, uh, doing a Bachelor of Materials Science and Engineering at UNSW. Uh, but I did actually start doing a double degree in Science and Arts um, and then decided to change just because I think I found, I realised there were a lot of my inventing, it was kind of more that practical hands-on engineering inventing type, type spirit that I had. Um, my arts was, I was going to be majoring in English literature. Um, I would still if I could be doing that, but unfortunately because the engineering degree is longer, if I was going to do that, I'd be at university for like another eight years and I was like, it's a bit long for me. <laughs> Anyone else got any questions for McKinley? Probably your other ideas? Yeah, awesome. Armour? Awesome. Uh, so I've had a couple. Uh, one of them was a solar panel, so it was called the SAS system, uh, which stands for sanitation and sterilisation. So this was a water-based project. And it was uh, basically powered by a solar panel. And so it had a mechanically rotating solar panel. So basically it started, if the sun was over there, it started facing that way. And on a simple kind of lever system, a water, a water drip would weigh it down at the start of the day and would drip out slowly throughout the day and it would start tilting to follow the path of the sun. And then I used, it was quite a complicated project, but I used that power then to uh, basically power a chemical filtration and a sterilisation system that was able to use the water that was being dripped, clean it, filter it, uh, and make it able to be used for sterile use as well. So drinking and sterile use. Um, and all of this was able to be made out of kind of timber, bamboo, whatever was, uh, other than the solar panel, um, whatever was around. Uh, and flat packed in the back of a car for either disaster relief or for developing communities. Uh, so that was one of them. Another one which was kind of a fun one I did when I was in year eight, uh, it was called Slow Euro Snap. You can tell I was very creative with my names. It was <laughs> one of the funnest parts. I'm not gonna say they were good names, but Slow Euro Snail. I uh, was looking at how I could protect seedlings in the garden without using pesticides because we had recently gotten a dog and mum liked her herb garden and. I liked my dog not to die from eating pesticides. <laughs> um, so I made this system, which was basically a water moat and two copper strips. 
and this was able to effectively deter snails. Uh, one really cool thing about snails, like their slime sort of stuff that they have, if you run it over two copper strips and they're connected, it actually creates a circuit and so it kind of gives them like a little, you know, like when you kind of rub your feet on the carpet and then you give someone an electric zap? Sort of like that sort of thing for a snail and surprise, they don't really like that. <laughs> so they turn around and go the other direction. Um, and so that was one of my year eight projects. There's been heaps more, so if you have any other questions about any other random projects I've done, let me know afterwards, but there's just two of the many. Mickey? I unfortunately do. My mother <laughs> likes to bring them out uh, when there's someone exciting coming over and go, put them on, put them on. Um, they're in a bit worse for wear shape. Um, hot gluing magnets to a piece of plastic and then trying to run around and move them, again, surprisingly, is an idea, maybe not the best one I've had, but I do still have them and they are still as fashionable as ever. <laughs> McKinley, there are obviously lots of people that have studied radiotherapy and, you know, worked in this industry for many, many years. What was it that encouraged you to think, do you know what, actually no one's thought of it like this or no one's taken a step back and, you know, yeah. looked at it with a new modern lens for or sure. new technology? Or so for me, it was a combination of I was fortunate enough, as, as you said, to have my dad working in the field. And so it started off as a bit of a over the table dinner conversation um, and, you know, he'd been they'd been coming up against this project at work and this, this problem at work. And so I said, you know what, this is not fair. I'm going to do something about it. And to be honest, at the start, it was really hard. You know, it's such a specialised field. You know, you have to have a master's degree to be like accredited to work in the field. So it was quite daunting at the start. Um, and I almost, there was a period of after about three months of solid research, trying to just get my head around the really easy stuff that I was going to give up. Um, and then my, one of our closest friends, who was kind of like a second father to me, was diagnosed with cancer. And that honestly hit me really, really hard. Um, that personal experience, seeing him go through radiation therapy, it became very, very real for me all of a sudden. And I decided, no, you know, I'm, I've got to stick this out. You know, I know that there's something here that I'm going to be able to find and I've got to do it. Um, and that kind of kept me driving. It was that personal experience and knowing that it wasn't just inventing in my backyard for myself anymore. It wasn't just those sunglasses that was going to benefit me. You know, I could see the effect that this could possibly have if I kept persevering and, and kept looking for that thing that could be done differently. I think that's really important. A lot of people ask, you know, where do you start with inventing? How do you start with ideas? And I think the easiest thing is just to look at your, the world around you. You know, look at your daily life, look at a friend's daily life, look at someone you know and think, how can I make their life better? It doesn't have to be solving climate change in big one go, but it's just one little thing that you can do to improve the world and, and just keep going from there. And you guys are the first generation to have been exposed to technology from a really young age. So you are already looking at the world in a completely different way to the generations that came before you. So it's how you can take that and kind of apply it to everyday problems to do something completely unique. Now, we've all had a bit of time to settle with our postcards. Does anyone mm -hmm. want to share anything from their 2040 self? I'd like no. to hear. I for know, me, I for me, <laughs> For me, one of the biggest things, um, obviously I have about 30 different things I could pick. Um, there are two things that you know, I'd like to solve. One of them is I would finally, I would like someone to create a microwave that heats my food all the way through so there's <laughs> not like cold Hot pasta spots. in the middle. I'm a uni student, I eat a lot of pasta. This is a real life <laughs> problem for me. Um, no, but not only that, obviously, for me, I'm very passionate about education and getting more young people like you guys into STEM from an early age, you know. I think we have the ability now to, with this technology, with education, we have the ability to be the change makers now, not 10 years from now, not in 2040, but to start when you're in year eight, year nine, year 10. Um, and so for me, it would be ensuring that everyone has access to that um, and everyone has equal opportunity to be able to do that and not feel like they're gonna be stopped because of their age, because their gender, because of, their background because they might not be getting the best marks. Um, and for me, that's what 2040 would look like for me. Amazing. I think we'll get there eventually. Well, STEM's going to affect every industry, isn't it? For it's sure. not like it's just going to sit in one little box. <laughs> if you want to work in fashion, wherever you want to work, it's all going to be affected by technology. And, you know, when we think about data and analytics at Microsoft, a lot of that is all, you know, maths and science based, and that's affecting absolutely everything.
Absolutely. My 2040 job was to think about um, empathy and emotion and mm -hmm. human connection. Because during COVID, I really missed hugging people. <laughs> I'm a hugger. Um, and I really missed that direct interaction. And mm -hmm. I think as we start to make technology really accessible and you know, provide much more virtual engagement so that people can experience much more of the world, albeit digitally, yeah. I want to make sure there's still that digital emotional connection. For so sure. for me, uh, that was probably my 2040 career That's goal. A great one. Anyone want Anyone to share? Else? Come on, guys. <laughs> no. Come on, be brave. It can be anything. <laughs> you could say you want rocket powered shoes and I would not be upset. <laughs> Oh, do you know, I would, do want a toaster that toasts fully. So while you're reinventing the microwave, I'll, I'll a toaster toast that evenly one. browns bread I'll would be fantastic. I'll go through all the appliances. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got something that we can make McKinley invent for us to make our lives a bit better? Yes. Um, all women around the world should have um, equal reproductive rights. Absolutely. That's that a good one. That would be amazing. There's some incredible women actually working towards that, aren't there? Like I think George Clooney's wife, she does a lot of work um, in pioneering that and working um, against governments. And awesome. It's also really important that as women, we really think about why these kind of programs exist to really drive women forward, you know? Like I think um, I've just recently read a fiction book called The Dictionary of Lost Words. Um, and the dictionary, the true story, the Oxford Dictionary was compiled by about 15 men. And the words to define woman are very negative mm -hmm. compared to the words to define men. And that bias is built into our history. And so as we think of the future and we think of AI and filters and um, algorithms that are being built, if our voice isn't a part of that building process, we're gonna be left behind. And there's gonna be these connotations that we don't even think about that are gonna affect the world around us. Mm -hmm. So it's super important we have our voice. Do we have another one down here somewhere? Go yes. on. <laughs> Mine's not really like a solution thing, no. but something I want is uh, less paper consumption and planting more trees than you're cutting down. Definitely. That's a big one as well. That's obviously um, something as well that you know computers help with. And I think if we can start to move towards that way as well, that'll be an easy, not an easy fix, but if we can all, all put towards it, um, absolutely, it'll really start helping our planet. And your school already invests in some really good hardware, so you don't have to print out paperwork <laughs> to write it out. You can do it all on screen digitally, so you don't have to have your, note, your notes and everything. Mm. Anyone else got something they want? Yes. Well, it's not a solution either, but like moving pictures, like that, like it was moving. That'd be cool. I'm thinking like Harry Potter type, having the pictures, <laughs> that, that would be cool. That'd be awesome. I'm sure someone will be able to, if not you, invent that. <laughs> right. So um, we're going to wrap up really shortly, but um, McKinley might stay around for a couple of minutes sure. if you want to um, ask any questions or have a chat. Um, I, McKinley talked about mentorship and having mentors around her. And one of the big things we want to do through this program is get you exposed to inventors and scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs who are doing things. Uh, and then you can realise, you know, they put their jeans on one leg at a time, they brush their teeth in the morning, uh, and they've worked through to build these things in their career. The most powerful thing I was ever taught by my current mentor was to end my apprenticeship. To stop training and thinking about what I might do one day, and just start to do it. And this is what this program is all about. We're going to expose you to amazing people, expose you to amazing ideas, but then get you actually inventing and designing and coming up with things. So thank you for hanging out with us. Um, it's been a strange old year, um, but this is a really um, cool thing for us to be doing towards the end of this year. See It Be It launches in 2021. Um, your teacher, um, Liz, will, will be talking about it with you. Um, you'll be working with uh, just a select group of schools from all across Australia. So there will be a competition, um, and I hope that this school is one of the schools that wins uh, and does really well and gets some of those prizes. Big thank you to McKinley. Let's give her one big round of applause.